A few years back, uh, I went with the kids uh, to an excursion down to uh, Old Maitland Jail. And at one point, our guide, who was a former inmate, uh, described what happens when you mess with razor wire. Oh, everyone thinks they'll be the one that can get over it. Nope. Once it's got you, there's no way out. They need to cut you out. Every move you make to get free just gets you in deeper, deeper trouble. Well, in last week's passage, God's people were in deep trouble, weren't they? Thick darkness. After their God giving them continual warnings and opportunities to turn back to him, the people rejected God and his word to them. And so God hides his face from his people. We saw in last week's chapter. The land is plunged into darkness. The absence of the word of God is that darkness. Where there is no light of the word of of God to his people, there is only darkness. And that darkness brings another darkness with it. The impending invasion of the northern superpower Assyria. God himself calls the Assyrians in judgment on his own people. and They are in great distress. Now as we read our passage today, I've got a question for you. What can God's people do? What can they do to escape the darkness? So I'm going to read our passage uh, now. So this is Isaiah 9, the first seven verses. Uh, You'll find that on page 607. Before I do that, I'm going to pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue to hear your word to us, we pray that by your spirit you might soften our hearts, that we might uh, believe what you're saying to us, we might understand what you're saying to us. By your Holy Spirit, would you apply it to our hearts so we can see the truth of the king that you have installed as a good king over your people. Uh, We do pray in your king's name, Jesus. We pray in his name. Amen. So Isaiah 9. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the future he will bring honour to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan and to Galilee of the nations. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time, as they rejoice when dividing spoils, for you have shattered their oppressive yoke, the rod of their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor. Just as you did on the day of Midian, For every trampling boot of battle and the bloodied garments of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. The zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God indeed. So what's the answer? What can God's people do to escape this darkness? Well, absolutely nothing. They're tangled in razor wire. God's people can do nothing to escape. Now that might sound like bad news, but I hope today we can see that it's anything but. Now, kids, you've got some uh, colouring sheets there uh, of either verses 6 or 7 of the chapter, and there's a word search. We've printed out the whole chapter there and I've bolded words that you can look for. Uh, sorry, the whole, the whole six and seven. Uh, there's bolder words that you can look for. So here's where we're going today. I'm going to take a while on these first few verses and then move quickly through the, to the climax uh, at the end of the passage. So 
Only God gives the light that brings peace to his people by enthroning his son. So we're at point two now. Only God gives the light. So God's people can do nothing to escape the darkness, can they? Have a look there in verse 1. Nevertheless, the gloom of the distressed land will not be like that of the former times when he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. See, the land is in great gloom and distress, but it's God who's done that to his people. He's humbled the land and rightly brought the judgment that he warned. He's brought them low. It wasn't their self-realisation or some kind of personal epiphany. They didn't humble themselves. God has plunged them into darkness and only he can bring them out. So what's the significance of this Naphtali and Zebulun? Well, see, they're at the top of Israel. Why are they especially humbled? Well, see, they, these are the regions that first experience the effects of God's judgment on the land of Israel from the north, the Assyrians. But this region, according to Isaiah, will be the first to experience the coming light. This little backwater, once humbled, will be honoured. So still there in verse 1, but in the future he will bring honour to the way of the sea, to the land east of the Jordan and Galilee, the name it came to be called, Galilee of the Nations. See, in the past, God's humbled his people and so it's only he can bring them out. See, they can't say, well, God's humbled us, but we can lift ourselves out of it. See, they've tried that so many times during their history. So many times to exalt themselves, but they just look like fools in front of their God and fools in front of the nations around them. God's humbled them, only he can bring them out, only he can honour them. It's like when uh, you're in trouble from your mum or your dad, you run away crying and they're still a bit grumpy. My mum used to say, you're in disgrace, Neil, and I would feel it. Well, it's nice that your big sister puts their arm around, her arm around you and says, oh, it's okay, but it's really the smile of your mum and dad, that's what you're after, isn't it? Only God can honour his people again. And that's exactly what he does. Look how, how, how it's written. We'll see it in a second. Isaiah is so sure that God's going to do the thing he's promised that he writes it as if it's actually already happened. See verse 2 there. The people walking in, in darkness have seen a great light. A light has dawned on those living in the land of darkness. See, God will turn his face again to his people. His word will come again to his people. The light will come into the darkness. But they couldn't make the light, could they? It has to come from outside them. Someone else has to cut them out of that razor wire. See, only God gives the light. That's our point two on the outline. So point three, as the light comes, it's going to create something. Isaiah hasn't told us what it's going to look like yet, but it's going to create a picture of life that every human in some way longs for. It's peace. If you're old enough, you know that it's a broken world. Our bodies break down, our minds fail, our leaders fail, we might fail exams, loved ones disappoint us, Loved ones die. We die. It's a broken world. But listen to the word the world Isaiah describes in verses 3 to 5. This is the world created by this dawning light. It's a world of thriving and, and joy under God's care. Verse 3. You have enlarged the nation and increased its joy. The people have rejoiced before you as they rejoice at harvest time, as they rejoice when dividing the spoils. It's a, re it's a world that rejoices like a season of bumper crops. It's peace 
But it's not a World War II ends kind of peace. This coming light makes the tools of war obsolete. They're taken to the tip. They've got no purpose anymore. This peace brings lasting peace. It's light. It's not long-lasting, but it's permanent. As we continue, For you shattered the, the, their oppressive yoke and the rod on their shoulders, the staff of their oppressor, just as you did on the day of Midian. For every trampling boot of battle and bloody garment of war will be burned as fuel for the fire. Well, it's starting to sound like a fairy tale, isn't it? But some, for some reason, fairy tales do live on, don't they? Disney lives on. Well, why? Because they provide an escape. It's an escape into a world that we haven't known, but a world that we long for. The happy ending. Lasting peace. But a world's anything but peaceful, isn't it? In every, almost every continent, there are ongoing conflicts. Our own nation is gripped by fire and drought and blame abounds in every direction, doesn't it? There's conflict. And this week, you might even be looking down the barrel of a Christmas with a family. Well, it might be a struggle for you to think of Christmas Day. See, thousands of years of human history shows that we are incapable of creating lasting peace on every level, global, national, personal. As a race, we are in darkness which expresses itself continually in every aspect of life. But Isaiah here is talking about lasting peace, national and personal. So confident. He writes as if it's already happened. Well, what have you got for us, Isaiah? You've really talked up this picture. History would tell us that it's just not possible. Peace isn't possible. It must be something pretty special he's talking about. Is it a, a new teaching? Or a new league of nations, perhaps? A new world order? What is this light that dawns on a land once laid desolate by br the brutal invaders? Well, we don't have to guess what it is. There was someone there when the light dawned and he wrote down what he saw. And here it is. Are you ready? He left Nazareth and went to live by Capernaum, by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. Well, it's pretty spectacular, isn't it? A man had a sea change. According to Google Maps, it's about a nine and a half hour walk uh, between Nazareth and Capernaum. That's it. But Matthew, in his biography on his eyewitness biography on Jesus, tells it that this occasion is the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy. And as this man begins to preach, he tells them who he is. That's the big deal. He says in verse 17, repent. Because the kingdom of heaven has come near. Repent. That's mercy language. Turn back to God. This is the word of God again. The light coming back into the darkness. The king of that kingdom has come near. The king has visited the earth. And it's the king offering the mercy. As Jesus enters Galilee and begins his public ministry, Matthew shows us that he's none other than this great light promised hundreds of years before. So let's just go back to Isaiah. And in the couple of minutes we've got left, I just want to show us one thing about this king. So we've seen that God himself brings peace to this people. That's our first two points. By enthroning his son, our last point. I love the, uh, the Netflix show, The Crown. It's about uh, the reign of our Queen Elizabeth. You'll know the story. At the age of 10, she, is suddenly, she suddenly finds herself next in line to the throne when her uncle abdicates. But from that moment, she is marinated in all things queenly. 
She trains, uh, she's trained in constitutions and manners and all sorts of things. She's groomed by those who will one day be her subjects. She's instructed by those who will never take her role, but they know that all, they know all she needs to know. They, they make her. But the one here talked about in Isaiah, this son, this king, he's not like that. Isaiah is about to tell us he's royalty, but he's born to a woman. He's given to us, though, from above. He's not our idea. We didn't make him. We didn't train him for the role. He's human, so he's one of us, but he's from God. Look there in verse 6. For a child will be born to us. A son will be given to us. And what good news that is. Good news that it's not up to us to find someone to rescue us. Rescue us from the darkness. See, God gives us that someone. God gives us the light. His promised king. The son. His son. How good it is that we didn't make him. That we didn't groom him for the crown. It's such good news because we look in there in verse 6. The government will be on his shoulders. So the governing of God's world will be on the shoulders of a single man. But a human given to us from God. God's man for the job. God's own boy. The Son of God. Now imagine if that kind of power had been given to one still stuck in the darkness. Well, this king says of himself, again in Matthew's book, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So he's not just the light of the nation of Israel. No, he's the light for the darkness that covers the entire globe. Every nation. He's the king of all nations, of all things. I'm not going to preach on these verses, but he's given these titles. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. What I want to focus in on is what does he do with this authority? What does his rule look like? Well, to sum up verse 7, this king who is God gives us his, what he establishes is a huge and thriving kingdom where justice and goodness and peace reign forever. Verse 7. The dominion will be vast and its prosperity will never end. He will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from now on and forever. See, this king reigns on the throne of David. That pretty much says it all. See, he's the one who fulfills God's promise to King David. It's about 250 years before this one, this promise. God said to David, I will raise up one of your great, 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 lots of greats, great grandson, who will reign over my people forever. And when he does, there is peace and justice. Not a peace we were able to bring. We're stuck in the razor wire. Not a justice that we established. We don't have it in us. The one who established this, this is from God. And that's why it's possible. In fact, it's guaranteed. That's why it's lasting. And just to underline it, what's already been laid out, the prophecy ends, the end of verse 7, the zeal of the Lord's armies will accomplish this. See, mankind has great zeal, doesn't he, for the betterment, betterment, betterment of his world, a real committed enthusiasm. But our efforts just end us up more tangled and tangled in the razor wire. It's a broken world and we broke it. But the Lord's zeal brings peace. But there's a catch. Well, it's a catch depending on where you stand. To some it's a catch. To others it's the best part of the whole story. Which is... The king of this promised world of peace reigns absolutely. 
There's no one in the kingdom who hasn't pledged total allegiance to him. No one who hasn't thrown in their whole lot with him. They've put all his eggs in their bar- is his basket. They've said, you own me. See, if he's cut you out of that razor wire, out of your own darkness, if he's forgiven the rebellion that you've set up against him, you know what he's like. The fact that Jesus reigns absolutely, that's the best part of the story. It's the king who makes what the kingdom is. The whole point of the kingdom is the king himself. The peace and the justice are found in him. Nothing gives you more joy than just to give yourself over to him. You've become one of his people, and like the rest of the people, you are eagerly waiting for his return. See, that is the time when we will see this kingdom established in a newly made world. On the other hand, it may sound like a catch. Not very good news at all. See, you like the idea of peace and justice, but not so much the absolute monarch. But friends, the king is returning. Make your peace with him before he does. On his first visit, he declared, Turn back to me, I'll receive you. That's a message he still declares. But his second coming, or at your death, that marks the end of the amnesty. And beyond that, you are cut off from the peace promised. So as we conclude our Advent series, my prayer is that you will have a great sense of anticipation as you return, the, wait the return of the King. For those who do not yet know him, may the thought of meeting him, unforgiven, cause you to return back to him. And for those who have known his forgiveness, the thought of his presence with his people is a so- source of our great peace and comfort, isn't it, in a broken world. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, you have given us a good King. May we anticipate his coming. May those who do not yet know him hear and believe his offer of mercy. Repent and you will be received. Those of us who do know him, may we eagerly await his coming and the peace that that brings to our broken world. We pray in his precious name. Amen.